So, yeah, hello everyone. Uh, this, I am Atkarsh and I am currently the chair of the Ultimately Photonic Society student chapter based in right? And we are bringing you a series of webinars that are to talk about, uh, basically helps you understand what, how, uh, how you can progress in your career or to make progressions. And this is the first in the three part series which focuses on academia and uh, First of all, before I start, I would like to thank everybody for taking the time out, especially all the panelists, myself here and Ara, for coming in and giving in their valuable and important feedback. Right. Uh, so yeah, uh, I think it's a good time to start. And uh, so I'll introduce our first speaker for uh, the event, which is Professor Miles Paget, who holds the Kelvin Chair of Natural Philosophy at the University of Glasgow. Uh, his research focuses on optical physics and in particular optical um, angular momentum. And he's been recipient of the UK Institute of Physics, Optics and Photonics Division Prize, Institute of Physics Young Medal, Max Brown Award of the USA, and in 2019 was named as one of the eight globally highly cited physics researcher in the UK by Web of Science. So without taking any, any further time, I'll hand it over to Professor Padgett here. Well, I got the first thing right. Well, thank I, I remembered to unmute myself before speaking. So uh, that's a that's a triumph uh, for someone of my age. Um, so thank you very much for that 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 rather daunting introduction. Thank you all for for giving up your uh, your Thursday afternoons and, and listening to a few words. L let me explain what I'm thinking of doing. I'm I'm going to speak maybe without any overheads or visual aids for 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 five or ten minutes. And, and tell you a little bit about myself and my own career. And then what I'd really like to do is just open it up to, to try and have a bit of a discussion. Probably easiest to do that through a questions and answers thing. Now, I think what would be best is if people want to ask questions, they type them into the chat box. At least then I can then um, either invite, I, I will then invite that person to by name to read their question out to us. Is that, I hope that's okay with everybody. Um, but I think it will just be very, it will be impossible to take questions unless we have some kind of electronic structure to the process. So, so if you type your questions into the chat box and you need to send your questions, I think in, in the Zoom language, you, you need to send your questions. If you send it to all panelists, then we'll all get to see them. So please don't uh, at any point start typing questions because um, hopefully we'll get some, otherwise it's going to be a very short afternoon. So, right, having said all of that, let me start off. Um, I am indeed in the University of Glasgow, which I'm sure you all agree looks just like Hogwarts Castle. You've no idea how long it took me to get that University of Glasgow sign with the correct perspective to one side. As you've heard, I am a professor of optics, and so I am 57 years old. Um, hence my difficulties with Zoom. Um, oh, there's there's a instruction to all panelists, please use the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, it says, okay, cool. Um, so let me just say, I, um, I did A-levels when I was at school. I did maths, physics, and chemistry in a very predictable way. I was an undergraduate at, at, the, uh, at the University of York. Uh, in my third year, I applied as my first choice in my final year honours project to do a geophysics project. And my second choice was build a carbon dioxide laser. Uh, I did not get allocated my first choice project. I got allocated the carbon dioxide laser. And I guess that's why I've turned out to be an optical physicist and not a geophysicist. I wanted to be a school teacher. And as I was nearing the end, in fact, whether I was doing finals, I heard a radio program while walking across a bridge with headphones on, and it was about a young French person who had disproved Einstein. And that young French person was Alain Aspect, who I think has been an honorary visiting professor at the University of Strathclyde a number of years ago. And, and he discussed, doesn't matter what he did, but he basically did the Bell inequality and, and proved that Einstein's interpretation of quantum mechanics was wrong. And at that point, I woke up to the fact that, my goodness gracious me, uh, all of physics isn't being done by dead people in the 19th century. It's still happening. Amazing that I didn't realize that as an undergraduate. 
and then decided I wanted to do uh, to carry on doing physics. And so, first of all, I went to do an MSc at the University of St Andrews in optoelectronic and laser devices, and then I did a PhD down in Cambridge in high resolution laser spectroscopy. Doesn't matter. And I then decided I was going to work in industry. And so I didn't become an RA. I actually went to work as with a technical consultancy, uh, solving other people's technical problems. And I did that for about three years. And then, um, in case any of you know, um, Malcolm Dunn and Wilson Sibbert at the University of St Andrews contacted me to say there was an opportunity to come back to St Andrews. And therefore I resumed let's say, my, an academic career. I, I think I was um, 29 or something of that order. Uh, I spent seven years at St Andrews, so I must have been less than 29, must have been 27. Uh, and then I moved to Glasgow in 1999. And the reason I moved to Glasgow in 1999 was not really an academic reason. It was because my girlfriend at the time, now wife, actually worked in Glasgow. And so Glasgow was a better place for me to be. And I have been here in Glasgow ever since. Uh, in addition to being a physicist, I did also spend five years in sort of university management as the vice principal for research. And I'm delighted to say that I am a physicist again now. Um, and so even in this time of lockdown. Now, before, so I've said a little bit about myself. Um, I'm, I'm going to say a few more things uh, and then we'll open up to questions. Uh, and this is now relating to what do I think were pivotal moments in my career. And undoubtedly, um, publishing papers during the course of my PhD was very important. So there is more to getting a PhD than getting a PhD. Ultimately, I'm not sure anyone ever read. I'm not sure anyone has ever read my PhD. Possibly the examiners did. But my calling card to a future job were the papers I published. I think I think that's true. And I think it's still true. Uh, not sure, but we'll say that. The people I met at conferences were hugely important to my future career, either as mentors or indeed the people that would ultimately offer me a job. And so I think that is still very true. That network is invaluable. When I went back to St Andrews initially, it wasn't to a, we'll call it tenured or continuing position. I came back as a fixed term position. And the thing that transformed, I think, my academic security was applying for research fellowship. In, I, and I applied for lots of them, incidentally. And uh, for, for many of them, I was unsuccessful, story of, story of my life. Um, and I think it was probably the fourth research fellowship I applied for that I was lucky enough to get, which was one with the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And then the fifth one I applied for was actually with the Royal Society, and I was lucky enough to get that as well. And so I, I ended up getting a URF. And at that point, that my, uh, my continuing presence within an academic career sort of became cemented. Undoubtedly, moving on from that time, I mean, there's different things I could pick out, but that was probably the, the biggest turning point of my career when I got that research fellowship funded. Um, and I'm forever grateful, not only to the Royal Society, plural, for awarding those fellowships, but for the wonderful mentorship I had from, mentioned them already, Malcolm Dunn and Wilson Sibbert. And I think in one's career, whatever career that takes, the role of mentorship is, is absolutely pivotal. And that mentor is not necessarily your immediate supervisor. It, it's someone else in the system that you just happen to click with and that is willing to share their experience with you. And, and I'd hold that up very strongly. My final comment before going into questions and answers would be, we are talking today about academic careers, and that's the title. Something that is, is really important to say, and, and um, I want to say it now, is we shouldn't get sucked into a belief that somehow an academic career is the, is the pinnacle of human endeavour and what everybody should want, aspire or strive to. Um, actually, 
there's lots and lots of hugely exciting careers out there. Um, nothing, nothing makes me prouder than the people that have been in my group that now work for example, for M squared lasers. And, um, so I don't, I'm, I'm very happy to engage around academic careers, but I, we should never lose sight of the fact that it is just one career. Right. So that was my uh, introduction. Um, so um, I've got this first um, question. Please, please start typing questions. Okay. I've got one here. So this question is from Alan Keenan. So Alan, I wonder whether you'd like to, um, I hope we can make your microphone live. Is that possible? Uh, I don't think the attendees can, uh, but I'll try and uh, quickly look in. But and can in... ah yeah. Oh, there you go. Hello, so, Alan. Let's please explain your question. Oh, so, yeah. So similar to yourself, Miles. I'm in my fifties. And I'm just going into the second year of my PhD in laser ultrasonics. Um, I'll be 54 when I've finished my PhD. So what are the chances of someone of my sort of age getting a job in an academic setting, if there is any chances? Hmm. Well, that's a that's a good, that's a, a good question, and um, let let I'll answer it in a second. But I'm going to I'm going to declare a health warning first of all, which of course any answer I give may be wrong. It's not intentionally wrong, um, and it, I'm going to try and describe the way I think the world is, not necessarily the way I would like the world to be. Now I realise in my position that I am. The world is partly the way it is because I have made it that way. <laughs> so I'm not trying to wash my hands of the responsibility, but but um, but but let's separate the two. So clearly, if one was to go into one's first academic position at the age in at my age in our fifties, um, that that would be a rare event. It, it's a rare event for two reasons. One is it's a rare event, but the other is not that many people perhaps try. So, but I think in your case, it would probably, success would probably be some kind of magical serendipity relating to a particular initiative that an institution, a university was seeking to pursue, which was very well aligned to your own immediate skill set, or indeed um, a knowledge uh, contact base. Now, having said all of that, I think there is a broader recognition now in the sector that non-traditional career routes, etc., are something which are to be encouraged. Having said that, those words are cheap and easy. Actually, practical changes and what that really looks like are different. I can imagine in a, you know, an academic like myself that's on an R&T contract, which means I do research and teach, is one kind of academic contract. I think we have seen a slight resurgence of roles around um, research officers um, which are our only posts, which act some kind of coordinating role within a research facility. So like imagine if you were, if your institution was going to set up a centre for laser ultrasonics, if that's what you said, then I can imagine in setting up that centre, they would create some technical officer posts where they want someone to mentor the PhD students, and, 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 and which is a fantastic job if, if you get it. So, um, I, I don't want to be cast, say sound negative, but statistically, you're looking to do something unusual, um, and I think one has to be alert to and explore um, bespoke opportunities, probably within institutional initiatives around specific technical areas so that's just one yeah thing. so i'm i'm you know i'm thinking similar like you know 
research fellow, highly unlikely, research assistant, possibly, knowledge exchange, I think between academia and industry, I think that'd be the type of role that would be probably more likely. And 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 I think this. I mean, the whole impact agenda, if I may use the I word, is not going away anytime soon. I think it is crystal clear that if the sector that we all work in is going to enjoy the level of funding that we currently enjoy, courtesy of the taxpayer, let's never forget that someone is paying for us to pursue our hobbies. Almost, I don't mean that in a bad way. I'm just saying we get paid reasonably well as members of academic staff at least to pursue what is essentially a lifelong interest in the subject um so you know i'm forever grateful that that is funded but we more and more i am sure and indeed should be will be held accountable to the contribution that we make to society and more and more i am sure universities are want want to see our research their research translated into societal benefit and that invariably requires um, a, a specific kind of person with a technical grasp of what is happening yet a i'm going to say maturity maturity is probably the wrong word Exper life experience let me say that uh, to engage with the end users I and mean, we can call them business development managers or, 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 or similar posts. And, you know, I see those posts advertised all of the time. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Right. That's okay. Thank you very much. Well, next one on our, our, our list seems to be Andrew Carlin. Andrew, if we can make your... if it's possible to make your microphone visible. Brilliant. Hello. Excellent. Yeah, fire away. Um, yeah, so it was just interesting to hear you obviously transitioning into industry straight after your PhD. Um, I'm not sure if back then, um, sort of if you had formalized grad programs like you do now, grad programs seems to be the only way into industry at the moment. Um, so I was wondering if there, you know, what is the natural way into industry at the moment? Is it a grad program? Is it a targeted job specifically sort of in your subfield? Or does it just happen to come from maybe companies you engaged with along the line of your PhD? I'm sure the answer, so thank you, Andrew, good question. I'm sure the answer is all of the above and I don't want to, you know, I'm just gonna give one answer here, which is one possible answer. And um, I mean, okay, so my own experience was I got a job with a company that was called PA Consulting Group. Um, why, why them? Uh, because the previous PhD student in our group had got a job with them. And and he said to me, would you like to come and join us too? I mean, that sounds ridiculous. I mean, I still had interviews and everything. But I heard about them simply because the other PhD student in my group had heard about them. And I would say generally in life, opportunities that have arisen with me and opportunities that I arise that I see for other people arise through serendipity <laughs> and it's like it wasn't it wasn't a plan you happen to meet someone in the coffee queue who worked for yeah. BAE systems it, it just just totally you know how do you plan for that I mean I, I don't know other than well actually why don't you make sure you go to some events that have coffee queues um, where there's likely to be people that you might be interested in meeting I will tell you also now another story, given it's all anecdotes. So one of my former group members who was a postdoc with me for a number of years was a, was a person called Matt Edgar, um, who's just a fantastic guy if you've ever come across him or met him. He now works for M Squared Lasers. Okay, so how did he get that job? Uh, Graham Malcolm, who's the CEO of M Squared Lasers, um, who I know quite well and we've had a number of projects with, said, Miles, Miles, I need to I need to bring a journalist round tomorrow and show him the project that we are working on. And I said, well, that's great, Graham. I'm glad you can do that, but I'm not here tomorrow. But don't worry, Matt will look after you. And so Matt looked after him and showed him around. And then that evening, Graham rang me up and said, would you mind if we approached Matt to see if he'd be interested in working with us? So, and I said, oh, that's great, fantastic, go ahead. And so, but the rest is history, as they say. 
my my point is it was a it was a chance encounter in a sense but clearly matt made a very good impression uh with with graham um and um you will in the course of a phd well covid lockdown makes that harder i know i am sure meet lots of people now those people may be the, the seminar speaker that's coming to look to speak at Strathclyde on the Wednesday afternoon or whenever you have your seminars and they're getting shown around the labs that 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 parade that happens as a seminar speaker by the way one of the best things you can do is go would you like to sit down because when you start looking around everybody's lab all afternoon you get pretty sick of standing up and so I always warm to the person that goes here have a chair so why don't you sit down while I explain to you what I'm doing so tip top tip Offer the visitor a chair and they'll be very grateful. Um, but engage with them. And I, I would imagine, just based on my experience, that half of your next positions, half of you will get jobs, whether those are academic or post-academic jobs, I don't know. And it will be through a contact that you met by chance in, in your labs. Or, or whatever, or at a conference. And I'm not suggesting that every moment is a job interview, but people remember, you'd be surprised how people remember. And I know that, you know, I've recruited postdocs quite frequently who I met while visiting their supervisor's laboratory. And the postdoc presented, so the PhD student presented to me what they were doing. And I went, well, not only is that interesting, but this person's clearly a, a, a across it, you know, oh, that's it, interesting. And then when I get an email in 18 months time that says, oh, I'm just finishing my PhD. Do you have any RA opportunities in your group? I go, oh, yeah, I met that person. And of course, there's still an interview. And of course, everything goes through proper process. But I think, you're, you know, you're, you're starting off in a very powerful place. So... You know, when someone, when your supervisor says to you, oh, we've got DSTL coming to look around the labs tomorrow, would you show them around? Rather than going, oh my God, you know, that's another thing. Just go, yes, COVID notwithstanding, you know, and make a good, and do a good job because that person could be the person that offers you your future job. Yeah, job. And so, um, you know, and then there's the other half, which is someone saw a job advertised on the internet and they applied for it in the traditional model. Okay, um, I've got another next one here, I think. Uh, Caroline, Caroline Whitfield. Is Caroline still here with us? Oh, yeah. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. I just failed the first rule. That shows my age, doesn't it? Okay. Join the club. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted to comment. It was more to build on Alan's point because I had exactly the same query, which is why I was looking forward to this session. So I'm an older PhD, it's slightly different in that I also lecture somewhere else without a PhD. Uh -huh. My interpretation of what to do, just to share is if you don't want to be on the knowledge exchange and actually like academia for academia's sake, which is I do, is just publish the hell out of anything you can. And I'm trying on the side to do as many projects um, which lead to some form of either conference presentation or publication. And it's quite intentional um, because I figure that that's going to make you on balance look attractive to a university who's thinking, is this person as you say, really going to keep delivering on the publishing side or not? And if you're a known quantity, I think you have an edge. I may be completely wrong in that assumption, but that's my current strategy. Well, Caroline, I hope it works out for you. And uh, it's not, not a daft strategy. If I, may, if I may just comment on it one little bit. If I, uh, undoubtedly, uh, authoring very high quality research papers is, is good for one's CV, let's not pretend otherwise. But it's interesting, I would say more and more at interview, 
once upon a time, people used to say things like, I've published 200 papers, I'm now ready to become a professor. Or I've published 50 papers, I'm ready to become a lecturer or whatever. I never, ever, ever hear those kind of statements anymore. In that the quantity of what we publish, clearly if the quantity is zero, there's a problem. But as soon as the quantity becomes non-zero, people are much more interested in, tell me about the best three papers you've published. Yeah, it, 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 It's the quality. And I don't want to start talking about four star and I don't want to start talking about impact factor. No, 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 that, I don't think that matters. But to be able to articulate why it is I am proud of these three papers that I have contributed. And this was my contribution to those three papers. This is what I did as part of the team. And this is why these papers were important, not just to the other authors on the team, but to people, specialists working in that area. This was the first paper that demonstrated to the world that it was possible to create a display device on a flexible membrane or what, you know, what I'm just making it up clearly. Uh, and so, you know, it's not about the journal per se anymore. It, it's about having a compelling narrative associated with one's best work. And I don't know if you've seen, there's a new look CV that's been pushed forward by the Royal Society which is very, very narrative based. So uh, it's almost the number of papers. Now, you know, it's very difficult to, if you've only published three papers, probably not all three of them are going to be brilliant, if you know what I mean. So I'm not, I'm not suggesting that, that clearly one needs a, you know, a, a baseline of, of activity, but you want to make sure that there's some um, I'm going to say pinnacles of excellence within it. A terrible phrase, but we know what I mean. It's it's the quality of one's best work that that drives things. That's very helpful. Thank you. That's okay. My my pleasure. Uh, right. I don't know whether I'm getting these questions from the right place or the wrong place, but um, there's a really good one here from O M J to all panelists. I don't know who O M J is. Um, uh, I'm suspecting we won't be able to find them. Um, would um, oh we we found them we found them brilliant. Omj, please un unmute yourself and go ahead. Uh, okay, uh, can you hear me? Uh, okay, yes, I actually want to find out particularly. Uh, you mentioned something like mentorship that it doesn't have to be necessarily with um, your supervisor but um, as it is how can one identify and be mentored by one who is not within one's field of research and also to get them to make them agree to mentor one well that that's a good question and again um Unfortunately, you know, physics is great, isn't it, as a subject, because, you know, there's right and wrong answers and something is governed by the uncertainty principle and that's the end of it. These things are, of course, much more nebulous. And what worked for me doesn't necessarily work for everybody. Let's just go through that again. And of course, today in HR speak, we have all kinds of formal mentorship schemes whether it be through Athena Swan or, or other university initiatives where, where people may be allocated mentors, and that's fine. I guess I come from an era where it was much more self-organized and, uh, and could take all shapes and forms. And everyone's very busy. And so you certainly can't turn up at someone's door and go, please, I'd like you to be my mentor. Well, you can and that might work, but probably not going to. It has to be grown. And, how, and you know, what does that look like? Um, you know, how about taking an interest in somebody else's work? <laughs> Everyone likes people that take an interest in their work. Um, you know, how, I mean, there's been a couple of people in my group have asked me to, 
to help them find a mentor from a different group. So, so people have come to me and said, look, Miles, could you, could you find me a mentor from another part of the university? Don't take that badly, Miles, but it would be better if I, you know, and I, you know, I've introduced them to people and suggested they might have a coffee together and then, you know, let them take it from there. And either it will, you know, and mentorship is very much a two way process in that I think the mentor has to also feel that they are getting something out of it, you know, and like, um, and actually, what is it that the mentor would like to know? You know, maybe I feel a little bit out of touch with what PhD students are feeling at the moment. And I'm going, well, I'm thinking of redesigning a CDT. I'd actually like to have a coffee with a couple of PhD students and find out what it is they'd like to see in a CDT. And so it's actually, you know, you've got something to offer both ways. And, um, but also, I mean, no one, just as a general tip, no one really like, you know, in the mentorship role, if, if, if all you do is turn up and go, what do I do next? That's a very difficult, I mean, it sounds like a very open-ended question, but you know, how the hell should I know? You, you know, you've got to put work into the relationship, which is, you know, oh gosh, I'm really not sure whether to uh, start applying for research fellowships now. I can see that the good reason to do it would be that, but the bad reason to do it would be this. What do you think? I mean, that, you know, that, um, you know, don't be ho- helpless. And, you know, at the end of the day, I'm, I may be 57 years old. It doesn't mean I know anything particularly. It, you know, your mentor is there as a sounding board to, to offer some advice, whether you, you know, I always say to people when I give feedback on a fellowship application, this is what I think, but actually what's important is that you submit the application you be- you believe in, not the one that I believe in. I'm, I'm just saying what, you know, what, how I reacted to it. Um, maybe other referees would react in the same way. Maybe they would see something in it I didn't. And actually a really good uh, piece of advice I was given when I was going for a job interview that I didn't get, just, uh, just another job interview I didn't get, was I, um, it was three candidates had come to St Andrews to be interviewed for a new professorship. And each of those candidates was allocated for the day a, a minder to sort of drive them backwards and forwards to the principal's office, make sure they got to somewhere at the right time and things. And I was one of those minders looking after one of the candidates. And again, this is, I saw this as a great networking opportunity for me because I was meeting this, this, this new person who ultimately didn't get the job, by the way, the job went to somebody else. But I actually still know them. All of these, that must have been 30 years ago. <laughs> And he gave me a very good piece of advice because I myself was going for a job interview two days later. And he said, Miles, don't don't try and second guess what they want to hear because you'll just be totally unconvincing. You just have to answer the questions as honestly as you can. And then if you get the job, at least, you know, everyone's happy. Don't try and second guess. And uh, actually, I, I took that to heart. Anyway, so clearly the next day I was honest about what I... That wasn't what they wanted. It was, it was a job at Oxford, uh, and um, but hey, it, I was lucky. It worked out okay in the end. Uh, by by ultimately, we uh, I actually then went on to get the research fellowship that we did that we discussed. So so mentorship is hard. You can't be allocated one. All you can do is is network away, and try and find somebody that you click with. <laughs>